Well, the wind is very still today. Last time I was out, it was a 20 mile per hour wind. Not a good day to do a test on the consistency and precision of your ammo. But today's an excellent test. It's about 29 degrees and uh, overcast. That doesn't really matter too much that way. At least not with a lab radar chronograph. You know, we used to like a little bit of overcast skies when we're shooting over a Ehler chronograph. But anyway, we have a target at 200 yards. I'll be shooting at the bullseye in the upper left corner. This is my hopefully final test with the neck tension experiment we've been doing. Uh, this is kind of the best of the best. Alpha, Charlie, and Echo. Alpha and Charlie are actually two different neck tension settings using the Hornady uh, match neck sizing die. Uh, set Echo uh, is just kind of standard. Uh, I've been neck sizing it with the Forster competition neck sizing die, which obviously does achieve a certain neck sizing. We know all about that, but there's nothing special with this brass. So we're going to go ahead and fire five rounds. I'm using my bobsled today, so I'm single feeding. We're going to see how it all shakes out. Here we go. That was nice. Uh, 25, 45, that's about a 30 feet per second difference. Good. 25.56. The bullseye in the upper right. Might have been. That was nice. Twenty five fifteen. Last one of set Charlie. This is our final set. Shoot this at the center bowl. Boy, that was a nice shot. Felt good. Boy, that felt good again, right there. Beautiful. All five of them felt so good. We are clear. You know, first impressions is, boy, that thing really shot high today, or I shot high today. And in fact, it shot almost four inches high even though it's zeroed with a slightly different load, it's zeroed at that same 200 yards. So I've been wondering about that, and we recorded this range footage a number of uh, days ago, and I've been wondering about 
what the heck is the reason for that? Did my scope come loose? You know, I talked about that previously. I've double checked uh, the torque on all of those screws on the bases and the rings and all that. Nothing's moving there. And one thing I will note that can influence the vertical difference or movement in the group like this is the humidity. Now normally out here I'm shooting at between uh, 20% to maybe a high of 40% relative humidity. In fact sometimes I'll be shooting at, I'm looking at my notes from uh, other sessions out at the range in my range logbook. Um, I'll, I've seen, you know, recorded 18% uh, relative humidity. Well, this time out at the range, 64% relative humidity. And you should understand that higher humidity means that there's more water vapor in the air, uh, and water vapor, hydrogen principally, uh, is lighter than uh, a drier um, atmosphere. So with a lighter uh, atmosphere or a lighter uh, ambient air conditions, it certainly is possible that that group shot higher because there's less density, less resistance uh, to the flight of that bullet. Now either way we look at it, we still have very useful groups and of course all the results from the lab radar are perfectly useful as well. So let's take a look at some of the groups. We shot just three groups out at the range, uh, and I did that in the ACE order. In other words, set A or Alpha was first, then Charlie, and then Echo. Now I did manage to get a good measurement of the group size off of our first group, even though the first shot flew straight up off the main target paper, but it did impact, as you probably saw or perhaps saw on the video, it did impact just a little bit above the paper on that cardboard. And I was able to locate that by studying the video very, very carefully and include it in that five-shot group. The others all impacted on the paper, albeit uh, fairly high, as I've already uh, mentioned. MOA group sizes weren't too bad. 0.8s is what I was sitting at, with uh, Echo, the last group that I shot, doing the worst, with about one and a quarter MOA. And now when I add the average for this session out at the range, we see that Alpha and Charlie did better than the average, but set Echo, E, did worse. So again, I always try to keep it below that line, come in below the below par, and so uh, Alpha and Charlie kind of get the thumbs up for this range session. But once again, when we're looking at or thinking about neck tension, this whole experiment that we've been doing, and we've now got 90 rounds in the books over three different, um, actually over four different range sessions firing 18 different groups. So if we bring all that data together and treat it in a cumulative fashion, this is our table of those overall results. And you'll see that the grand average is 1.05 MOA. Graphing these data, we see that sets A, C, and E still are doing better than B or D. And we talked about that at length in our previous episode, and we analyzed the heck out of it. And statistically, there are some differences with those two sets, Bravo, B, uh, and D, Delta. So that's why we didn't include those two in this range session. When I first set up this experiment, I had intended to have five different or actually four different neck tensions by using four different neck sizing bushings in that Hornady match die set. But what I've learned is that just because we're affecting a certain neck size, outside diameter neck size with that die, by the time we seat the bullet, we'll get some spring back in that brass 
and the end result of neck tension on a given bullet or a set of bullets may not be any different than the another set of bullets that were neck sized with a slightly different bushing. And that's really how it played out for me in this experiment. Sets A, B, and C ended up with an identical uh, neck tension of three thousandths of an inch. My control set E had a neck tension of two thousandths of an inch. And delta, the other group, had a neck tension of one one thousandths, or in other words, the loosest or lightest neck tension of any uh, that we worked with in this experiment. So now if we kind of look at it in that way, what I did is I grouped A, B, and C together because they had the same neck tension and graphed the group sizes by actual neck tension. So now we're down to just three different groups for our experiment. And on the x-axis of this graph, we have the neck tension, the lightest or lowest neck tension on the left, and the highest neck tension on the right. And we see a trend looks like it is appearing. So if I now take that same data and I plot it on what we call an XY scatter plot, looking at how neck tension, again on the x-axis, affects or drives our group sizes on the y-axis. I can also apply what's called a trend line. A little bit of statistical analysis there given to us in an R-squared statement uh, that indicates how much neck tension affects group size. And we have a pretty high number there. The R-squared is 0.96. But note that this is not a linear relationship. In other words, it is a non-linear relationship between neck tension and group size. So whenever we see a non-linear relationship exists, we have to understand that we're really dealing with what we call a complex problem. There's lots of parts involved in driving or determining uh, group sizes. And certainly it's not just neck tension that drives uh, group sizes. Now while our trend analysis certainly suggests that there is an effect of neck tension on group size, a statistical analysis, again using ANOVA, results in a p-value of 0.42, and that tells us that it's not really a st statistically significant relationship or a statistically significant difference between these different neck tensions. So now I need to answer some questions. It's time for a decision. We set out weeks ago to answer the question, does neck tension matter? And posed in that way, Statistically, we have to say neck tension doesn't matter. We have a very, very light neck tension of one one thousandth of an inch, and statistically it is no different from the results we have achieved with a much tighter neck tension of three thousandths of an inch. But yet our results suggest that there is something to it, and you have to understand that when we're at like a 90-95% level of, of really driving down our group sizes and our consistency and our precision on a rifle, that next little increment of 1% improvement or a half a percent improvement might be very, very difficult to detect in an experiment like what we had just done. Yes, we fired 90 rounds, um, but we might need 500 rounds to really answer that question definitively, because really, we have still a fairly small sample size of not 90, that's the number of rounds fired, but instead 18, that's the number of groups that were analyzed. 
And in the world of statistics, kind of the magic number is 30. So we've just barely crossed over that halfway point of normally what is considered a sufficient sample size. So I can't say with 100% assurance that neck tension doesn't matter. Based on the data we have so far, I kind of have to say that. But I'm thinking that there is more to it. Look at that trend line, right? That trend line does show a relationship between looser neck tensions and tighter neck tensions. We're seeing some of these groups with somewhat slighter neck tensions always performing better. They didn't perform necessarily any better than our control set, but our control set had a neck tension applied to it too, even though we didn't purposefully set out to uh, achieve that with those Hornady dyes. So this experiment is not really so cut and dried. It might have been more cut and dried if groups or set B and D kind of fell in line real nice with, uh, along with A, C, and E, but they didn't. And a person now has to wonder, and maybe you've been wondering, why did Bravo and Delta do so darn bad or so different from everything else? Delta, we could say, okay, maybe that is that very, very light neck tension. But what about Bravo? It had the exact same neck tension as Alpha and Charlie. And what you might be thinking now also is, maybe it's harmonics. Well, that's what we started off our entire season talking about was barrel harmonics. Maybe there's something slightly different with those cases that caused our group to move away from a harmonic node and more toward an anti-node type of position in those barrel harmonics. Well, I've been thinking the same thing. And what a great way to wrap up the season in our next episode. I'm going to be taking that ADG brass that we worked with a long time ago, it seems like now, and I'm going to be loading two different five-shot groups in that same ADG brass. One of those groups will have a tighter neck tension, and another one will have a looser neck tension. And the powder charge is going to follow the powder charge that we determined for our harmonic node. And I'm going to pull out some Lapua brass, and very similarly, I'm going to take two different groups with slightly different neck tensions applied to it. And, but this is going to be loaded or charged with uh, a powder charge determined from our velocity node that we worked on years ago, actually. And I'm going to shoot those four groups out at the range at 200 yards off the bench. And so it's all going to come together in our season finale of Extreme Reloading, nodes, necks, and sills. You won't want to miss that episode. Thanks for watching.